Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are very excited and honored to be able to welcome Professor Sonu Shamdasani. He is a professor at University College in London a very long-time student and scholar of the history of psychology, uh, particularly Jung's work. At the beginning of the 21st century, he co-founded Philemon Foundation uh, with Steve Martin, and Philemon Foundation is dedicated uh, to publishing Jung's unpublished works and really made all kinds of excitement and news around the world with the publication of Jung's Red Book in 2009, the book that stands at the center of Jung's work. Uh, There are other works of Jung that have not yet been published, including his original manuscript for uh, his later memoir, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. And in order to continue this incredibly important work, uh, Philemon is needing to raise about $260,000 to continue bringing this work that Jung pioneered uh, to the public. So welcome, Sonu. Uh, We're delighted to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. So jumping right in, Sonu, The Philemon Foundation has just put out Jung's Black Books. And for our listeners who might not be familiar with that, can you give us a little background about what that is and where it stands in the import of Jung's canon of work? Jung commenced writing in the Black Books in the autumn of 1913. It has the the daily record of his self-investigation, his self-experimentation, which he called confrontation with the unconscious and the confrontation with his soul. The entry spanned from 1913 to 1932. The Red Book was a work composed in a literary and theogonic form by Jung, first in 1915 and later in 1917, drawing on the the key uh, active imaginations between 1913 and 1916, which he then elaborated, retranscribed, and added a a second layer of interpretive commentary. So this material encompasses the raw material of all the the period that encompassing the writing uh, of the Red Book and also way beyond that. So prior to the publishing of the Red Book and now the Black Books, most readers would have known Jung through his collected works, which had been published a, a long time earlier. And people had... I think, a perception of who Jung was, both as a contributor to the science of psychology, but also as a person, as a human being. The Jung family, if I understand correctly, was very protective about keeping the Red Book and the Black Books private. They had it in a vault. 
They were concerned about the work being distributed. What do you think made them feel so cautious about bringing this material forward? And how might people's perception of Jung be different now that they can read these things? Well, I think if you look at the level of the literature written on Jung and the level of what is written on Jung in so-called biographies, I think one would be find it quite sensible to be cautious uh, concerning Jung's public reception and the lack of, um, at that time, historical work into Jung and the amount of myths, uh, gossip, and fantasy that circulated. Mm -hmm. So um, vis-a-vis the Red Book, when I started my research on it and uh, found certain transcriptions and brought them to the attention of the Jung uh, estate, at that stage, I had edited his seminar on Kundalini Yoga, so I had been in contact with him and had begun discussing the whole question of what to do with the vast cache of Jung's manuscripts, which had only recently been um, catalogued. I mean, it, it's quite mm. striking that the collected works was formally sort of deemed finished in 1976, but the, the first almost complete catalog of his manuscripts was only done in 1993. Wow. And so I was in conversations with him as to what to do with that material. At that stage, no one alive in the family had, had read the Red Book. They basically asked, you know, what's in it and what's it about? So again, there are, there are myths of censorship that were floating around in the Jungian world, uh, but no one had actively considered it. And so that was, you could say, an opportune moment. And when it came under consideration, it was quite clear on the one hand that this was a work, though not published, was written for publication. Mm -hmm. There were certain copies in circulation and that Jung had left stipulations, both regarding the red and the black books, uh, that were in a way quite similar to the date stipulations with his correspondence with Freud, namely that it should be put in an archive made available, say after 10, 20, I mean, 20, 30 odd years or so. And that it also constituted the basis of the collected works. So when that was considered in in that light, uh, they decided to release it for publication based on the proposals that, that I'd prepared. You know, Sanu, I'm, I'm aware when I started getting interested in Young and indeed began training, you know, we only really had the collected works. And I have uh, had, of course, read MDR, Memory Streams Reflections, in which Young describes the confrontation with the unconscious. He gives us a picture of what he was doing at that time and gives us a sense of some of the content. And then he says something like, and I believe this is in Memory Streams Reflections, that it, all of his psychology dated back to that period and his investigations during this time. But that's about all I knew. Yeah. And then with the publication of the Red Book, now we had access to much more of the content of these self-investigations. And, and what I'm realizing now as I'm dipping into the Black Books is it's just a much, and thanks in part to your scholarship, you know, to, to really understand, you know, what, what he was doing on a certain day, what that active imagination consisted of how that paired with what was going on in his outer life. I thought it was fascinating that he was seeing, you know, so many patients throughout this period. It gives you a real sense. Oh, oh, and and linking it to what was going on in the in the wider collective at the time, which was mostly the the lead up to World War One and the beginning of it. So all these layers of things, really understanding how this happened, putting it in this historical context that there were others who were undertaking similar kind of investigations. It's really very rich. And also to see the ideas that arose from these investigations that he later, you know, as, as I think you put it, kind of translated into the language of the spirit of the times. The, his work for the rest of his life was to go back to these active imaginations and mine them and then translate them into kind of scientific language. Yeah, that's, I mean, that sums it up quite well in the sense that this was the, the prime material, the prima material that Jung uh, was at the center of um, his research, uh, not only during this period, but for the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, there's a place in which um, you say in your commentary, you know, that Jung had discovered uh, that things like uh, yoga, Buddhism, you know, other kinds of uh, traditions were all based on active imagination, and that his job was to have the experience, and then he uh, recorded that experience in the black books. Uh, which some of which got transcribed into the Red Book, and then to try to bring it uh, to the world from a human and scientific viewpoint. It reminded me of, of the process of um, bringing a dream to the surface of how we go about, we have the dream, somehow we record the dream, maybe we interpret the dream. I'm just appreciating the extent to which Jung's work was based on lifting up and understanding material from the unconscious. It was an exp exploration of the visionary imagination. Hmm. That was the theme that, in a way, he started off from, from Transformations and Symbols of Libido, was the significance of fantasy thinking. And his hypothesis, uh, his main, you could say, driving conception was that the deeper you go into that, the more collective and universal it becomes, i.e. that it has myth-like components that don't simply concern you as an individual, take you down into the substrata of, of the human mind. And that, you could say, was a central insight that he continued to uh, explore develop and try to convey to a medical and scientific audience for the rest of his life. Mm. There are so many places in the collected works and here where it seems Jung is pleading almost uh, with people to honor this and to value it, that there was a lot, has been a lot of resistance, or he seemed to perceive that there was a lot of resistance uh, to his ideas about the importance of the collective unconscious or the mythic mind. That's the case. They're still uh, heavily sort of uh, contested today. You know, hence the resistance perhaps to uh, on the part of the young, young family to publishing the Red Book that once again, perhaps it would not be well received. It would not be truly understood. I don't think there was a resistance because once the issue was... Uh, considered fully, uh, there was no reason not to publish it. And you can see from the echoes that the publication had is that the general reading public, at least, is a lot more interested in, in the historical Jung than the myths and legends uh, around Jung. Jung, the man of flesh and blood, was a far more interest to people. It was so moving to see the reception of the Red Book. And if I'm not mistaken, it sold out its first print run and, and had to be republished many times. and was kind of like a surprise bestseller. This enormous, um, beautiful volume. But the, the people were just hungry. People are hungry for this kind of material. I mean, it was a surprise to some. Not to, not to myself, not to uh, a late uh, editor, Jim Mars, uh, who was convinced that uh, this work would uh, reach a broad populace if, if published in the appropriate way, which he, he managed to, to do in the sense, if you look at the, quite literally, the, the, the level of sales of works that are in part drawing from or inspired by Jung that have like sold millions of copies. If you imagine a work which is 100% proof uh, of Jung, you think, okay, that should surely be able to have a broad readership. It seems to me, Sonu, that when I look back at my own training as a Jungian and as I work with candidates, uh, we are all administrators for the Philadelphia uh, Jung Institute, so we're involved in training as well, that historically there seems to be ambivalence about the use of active imagination, that with the publishing of the Red Book and now the Black Books, it puts this fantasy thinking, active imagination at the center of the work in a way that is undeniable. I remember when I was just starting out in my training because I have a background in Kabbalah and I found myself wanting to talk about 
mysticism and internal experiences that I was advised in no uncertain terms that that would make me a suspicious character in my training process <laughs> and that I should at the very least keep that under wraps. And so I wonder about this feeling that admitting the role of active imagination uh, may be in some ways transgressive to the fantasy of, of analysis and its validity in the psychological world. Well, there are several places where Jung repeatedly states that there is no far-reaching analysis without the use of active imagination. And what he meant by that was, you could phrase the psychotherapy of the individuation process, i.e. in his view that that was the sine qua non for progressing that. Um, I wrote an article studying Jung's technique in the journal Sample Therapy called Jung's Practice of the Image. And what I argued there is it is really the signature technique in terms of if you look at the practice of, of psychotherapy and uh, Jung's place within that, that's Jung's main contribution to the practice of psychotherapy. So it seems to be what happened in many countries in the Jungian world was there was a greater accommodation to the, you could say to the doxa and the mores of the general psychotherapeutic field and an abandonment of the signature traits of Jung's work. I'm not saying that those practices aren't useful or therapeutic or, or what have you. So I'm not speaking about in terms of evaluation, but it did leave to one side the method or, or methods that Jung saw is actually the most critical. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point. And following up on that, um, you're quoted in a 2009 Times of India article as saying that you you thought that contemporary psychology and psychotherapy was in a mess <laughs> and that you wanted to figure out how it had got into that state. I'm I'm sort of following an intuition that your statements about the importance of active imagination perhaps relate to this mess that psychology and psychotherapy are in. Well, in, in 1894, William James reflected on the state of, of psychology and said, there's not one single law that all psychologists can agree upon. And what sort of discipline uh, is this? It doesn't even know the terms in which such a law would be framed. And many observers on the psychological scene saw that it quickly descended into a Tower of Babel, where the only commonality was individuals using the word psychology and an insistence that it would constitute a science. But what psychology was and what was scientific about it, they all had different views. And it seems to me that situation has not changed today, which is not to say that there aren't incredibly fascinating things going on in psychology, but there is little by way of consensus. So my interest in a historian is to say, well, what is this discipline? How does it work? It clearly doesn't work in, in a way that approximates the field that psychology is sought to emulate, Newtonian physics or chemistry or so forth. I mean, the notion that you, psychology would come out with similar types of table of elements or fundamental laws or so forth. Uh, that hasn't happened. So what is this discipline? And it seems to me that um, history is one good way of trying to sort of look at what psychology does and how, how it was put together. What do you think it is? Uh, I don't think it's one thing in the sense that the term psychology then was applied to an ensemble of theories, worldviews, practices, social movements that each have to be individually described and, and characterized. So in my work on Jung, I tried to sort of look at, okay, what did he mean by the term psychology? And that's not a, it's not a constant through his work. There's different conceptions of, of psychology. And what did he try to do with it? How did he attempt to, to get there? And I think what texts such as the Black Books show is one aspect of how he attempted to develop a psychology based on the visionary imagination, namely to reflect on his, on his dreams, but mainly on his active imaginations. 
and to try to look at the symbolic aspects and the manner in which they portrayed symbolic movements, i.e. that there was a progressive tendency within them, which he then called the um, individuation process. What I'm thinking about uh, is at the core and at the heart of Jung's work was his personal process uh, that we have had first through the red books, but the antecedent was the black books. And Jung's uh, protest, really, about how the living work of great minds in history then becomes institutionalized. I'm also thinking about the tension between his inner process, act of imagination, this symbolic and mythic uh, lens, experiential things that he encountered, and how to put it out there in a way that seemed uh, intelligible to Western minds, left brain process, et cetera. At the heart, he formulated is uh, the, the centrality of the individuation process. I'm curious, going back to all this from William James, about how you think he saw the heart of psychology as a practice, how he saw analysis as a practice. It doesn't seem that at the heart of it, it was an intellectual endeavor. Well, you're right to say that Jung had an ambivalence towards institutions. He spent time engaged with institutions, and you could say, saw up front the, the politics and the problems they're in, in terms of first up in his, as president of the International Psychoanalytic Association, and later as president of the International General Medical uh, Association for Psychotherapy in the 30s. So he understood something about institutions of psychotherapy. You could say, in a way, also experimented with different forms of association, such as with the Psychological Club in Zurich, or then the Association of Analytical Psychology in, in the teens in Zurich. What he conceived in the main of his psychology was an interdisciplinary science of complex psychology, as he termed it, that would have applications to both education and psychotherapy. So on the one hand, an interdisciplinary science of psychology, which would have applications. Now that inter interdisciplinary science was, uh, of course, intellectual. I mean, if you look at Jung's work, he is actually the most intellectual, I think it's fair enough to say, of, of all 20th century psychologists. He's writing works in which he assumes you have uh, some familiarity with Latin and Greek, even to be able to follow what he's saying, so that it's not something that is not intellectual. It's it's highly intellectual, but in a way, it's, it's trying to gain the true sense of the intellect, something that expresses the, um, the fullness of life. Yes, exactly. That the intellect is in the service of, um, Jung was certainly one of the great intellectuals probably in, in history, but I'm wondering, you know, takes me to wondering how he saw the core of the analytic process itself of when one is in the consulting room with an analysand, what is required for an analyst uh, in his or her own personal experiential process that goes beyond or beneath a merely intellectual process. Jung tended not to write that much about psychotherapy and certainly not in a, in a prescriptive manner. And in a certain sense, one can see why in the sense of the difficulties of trying to describe what, what takes place there. I've written a, an article recently on reconstructing Jung's practice from first-hand accounts from correspondences and diaries of, of patients. And it, it fleshes out what Jung says, uh, sometimes in an elliptical sort of manner um, in his works, but not, not in any great detail. It's hard to sort of typify it in general, in the sense he practiced in, in a way that was quite free in a certain sense, but had its own rigor. And if you understand sort of the assumptions which that guided his work. Sunu, where is that? Where could we find that article where you've kind of 
reconstructed his analytic work. It's in a volume uh, I co-edited called uh, Medical hum- Humanity and Inhumanity in the German-Speaking World. Uh, I could send you the, the reference. That would be great. We'll include it in the show notes. Sonu, I've been sitting with a question for a little while relative to kind of enticing people to really buy the black books and really um, pour over them. What might the readers find in the black books that would surprise them about Jung? What do you think? The outlines of Jung's theories are well known. I mean, not necessarily well understood, but but well known. And vis-a-vis what we were discussing earlier about the individuation process, you have uh, Jung's presentation of that in a series of publications from 1916 onwards, from the structure of the unconscious, psychology of the unconscious processes, relations between the eye and the unconscious, and so forth. And he presents, you could say, a, a general schematism um, in terms of the confrontation later with the shadow and with the anima, with the man of personality and, and the realization of the self. But what you find in the black books is not an abstract schematism, but you find the full, rich, thick description of Jung's encounter with the visionary imagination, which he then later attempted to distill into those formulations. So you have the whole landscape as opposed to just a schematic diagram. You can look to see the elements by which Jung tried to generalize and abstract his conceptual model on the basis of his own experience and what he replicated with his, with his patients. And you can then also understand that model in a new light. So it's not just a question of just, here is some new material that is interesting by itself, which of course it, it is, but it makes visible the imaginal substrate of Jung's conceptual formulations, which then appear in a new light. So it enables the existing works to be understood in a new way. So I think that that might be a bit that might surprise people is not just the content, but how that enables, a, you could say, a fresh rereading of the, the existing works. Well, and I think, as you mentioned before, it gives you a sense of young, the flesh and blood person who's really struggling with this and wrestling with it, rather than just reading the later works that where these ideas kind of appear, you know, whole cloth, as if they just exploded out of nowhere. But, but you get a, a sense of the person who was struggling and to a great degree suffering this. That's right. It also can or could, for people who are particularly sensitive, give them a depth of feeling for this strata out of which the living work arose. That one of the ways that universal truths stay alive in civilizations is through their embodiment in symbolic images. And if Jung was right, that the depth of his experiences brought him to a collective level, then those images and encounters are capable of evoking some nuance or some even direct experience, perhaps, similar to his own. And I wonder if that's why visionaries for thousands of years will recount their sojourns. Yeah, it's an interesting point. This material is not inert. It is psychoactive. It's like when you mm-hmm. stir embers of a fire that hasn't been put out and sparks fly off in it that can reignite. In that sense, it can it can re-stimulate the imagination of, of others because there's life in it. I'm wondering if that happened to you, Sonu, pouring over it all these Uh, many years, whether you yourself felt uh, some embers in your own soul stirred and what that was like. Well, by that analogy, I got a lot of black smoke and soot all over. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm thinking that Jung's reading the the Gnostics and, and other works, that that was also psychoactively active and that that may have stirred some of his embers that's certainly the case in the sense that it's important to to qualify. Yes, this material was at the center of Jung's work, but it, he was in turn stimulated 
by his study of comparative mythology, comparative religion, uh, as well as also the historical readings in many disciplines that he was engaged in. So, and, and in particular, his readings in comparative mythology, comparative religion, stimulated his own fantasy, not in an imitative way in terms of, it's not that you find straightforward derivatives, but stimulated him to imagine in a mythic manner. Mm -hmm. and, and now he can inspire us to imagine in a mythic manner as well. You know, I just want to say when, when you, we were talking about this process of sort of refining this prima materia, the image that came up for me is you, you go to a, a jeweler's shop and it's a, a real fine craftsman and there are these beautiful objects made from gold or precious stones and uh, and it's they're lovely to look at, but but what what a completely different and very exciting experience it is to go into the mine and see the veins of raw gold in the matrix, and that's that's, right. that's kind of what you brought us with the black books. That's what it enables us to, to enter into Jung's workshop. That's a great analogy, Lisa. I'm wanting us to uh, turn to the more practical matter of uh, Philemon and what lies ahead for Philemon and what your current needs are for funding, because that, that's the mine yeah, <laughs> from, that's from right. which additional jewels will emanate. Mm, yes. So maybe just tell us a little bit about uh, when you founded Philemon, what, what was the, this repository of jewels and gemstones like and how much of it have has Philemon managed to publish and how much of it is yet to be mined? It goes back to 1988 when I met uh, the late Michael Fordham, uh, one of the editors of the Collected Works, when I realized much to my surprise uh, that there was much of Jung's writings that had not been included in, in the Collected Works. Uh, a lot of his manuscripts only came to light after he died. It seemed that no one had thought to look in the manuscript cupboard when they uh, compiled the bibliography of his writings. That there there was a manuscript cupboard? Yes. Fordham and Gerhard Adler, who didn't agree about very much, but the one thing they did agree with was this material should be published. And they were then, uh, at that stage, overruled by the publisher's and Jung's family that had recently just come into, you could say, ownership of, of Jung's literary remains and thought you know, this was enough at that stage. And that material was left to one side. Uh, so for me, it was an astonishment to say, well, you have a collected works, but it is a collected works. It's not a complete works, despite that, at that stage, at least being the general understanding. So... I began researching the, the actual manuscripts from 1994 uh, onwards. They're in three figures, uh, the amount of manuscripts. Wow. Wow. Uh, this ranges from draft notes, talks, papers that were delivered but not finally finalized for publication, to additional seminar notes, and that's not even to mention the correspondences. At that stage, one had two volumes of correspondence published by Gerhard Adler with the assistance of Annie Liafe. I think it was about 1,500 letters in those volumes or thereabouts, and we have the correspondence with Freud. At Jung's Jung archives at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology at Zurich alone, in terms of correspondence two-way, i.e. correspondence of Jung and the recipient, there were over 35,000 letters. And that's just there. That's not to include what you have in other archives or, or private archives. So you only have just, you could say, the tip of the iceberg in terms of Jung's correspondence. So it's safe to say in terms of just sheer, you could say, words, this is, this is more unpublished um, than there is published even today, if one is including the, the two-way correspondences. Why is that important? Thomas Mann once said only, only the comprehensive is truly interesting. Mm -hmm. in that you're dealing with 
like a vast jigsaw puzzle where you have one missing piece that is interesting enough in itself, but it also begins to illuminate the other pieces. You see a pattern, as it were. Mm-hmm. So there's this reciprocal movement when you, the more you publish, it not, it's not just adding a further item, but you begin to understand the works in the round. At this stage, the next volume that we have coming from the Philemon series, the Princeton University Press, is Jung's lectures at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in the 1930s on the psychology of yoga and meditation. We've just published uh, Jung's correspondence with uh, his friend, the theologian Adolf Keller, which is the first major extensive correspondence that Jung had with a Protestant theologian. Uh, that's just to give a couple of examples of what, what's just come out in the series and what will come out shortly next year. We're currently hoping to raise, as you kindly mentioned, $260,000 to remain in existence through to the end of 2020 to uh, publish, in addition to the works that we already have in train, a work that was, when I first came across it in the manuscript, it was just simply titled Unpublished Book. Oh my gosh. And it's a manuscript of over 100 pages on the psychology of alchemy and individuation mm-hmm. written in uh, the 1930s. And following that, Jung's seminars given in Paul Zeth in England in 1923. It's a seminar which deals with the first half of it is on the technique of analysis. In fact, it's actually one of his most extensive discussions of the technique of analysis. And it then switches to the historical effects of Christianity and a meditation of the place of analytical psychology within that. So those are the next two we're hoping to raise funds to, um, to publish. And in terms of the work involved, uh, when you're dealing with unpublished manuscripts, it's not just a question of just typing it out and sending it to, to the press. What we tried to do was do historical and scholarly editions unlike that of the collected works. When it's dealing with texts 100 years from when they were written in many cases. And so we've had them with detailed historical contextualizations and, and introductions and full scholarly apparatus. When Jung mentions a figure, say who this figure is. Mm-hmm. Give, give the reference. <laughs> Actually translate the Greek and Latin. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> shall we say, not a few arcane references that take weeks to hunt down just for particular footnotes. Or mm. in the case of the his lectures at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and it's the same with the Paul Zeth lectures, uh, one is dealing there with often four or five different sets of notes for one lecture that has to be itself painstakingly put together to try to establish as close as possible a reconstruction of Jung's lost oral Mm -hmm. delivery. So that work of even putting one page together um, sometimes requires uh, weeks. That's even before you've you've, uh, translated it. So I'm I'm sort of back a few clicks. This this book, unpublished book on alchemy and individuation. I'm sort of gobsmacked by this. I mean, there's of course there's several volumes in the collected works that deal specifically with alchemy. And and I'm just wondering what would a new book add to our understanding of, of alchemy and its psychological applications? I mean, that, that just is very tantalizing. Jung wrote this in about 1937. So at that stage, it seems to me he was beginning to consider how to introduce the whole subject of alchemy in book form. And the beginning that he took was a disguised account of his dream that readers will be familiar with from Memory Streams Reflections of encountering the subterranean uh, phallus. And he then gives an extended amplification of that. So he uses that as his prime example to introduce the th- these themes. Wow. And it then uh, continues focusing on the motif of hermaphroditic symbolism in alchemy and in, in other traditions. So you could see 
okay, at a certain stage, Jung decides he's not going to put, he decides not to begin by putting that dream out in the open, even in a disguised form, and decides to begin with uh, the dreams of Wolfgang Pauli, again, initially in a disguised form. So you can see the, the reasons why at that stage he says, okay, I'm, I'm going to go about this a, in a different way. But you're left with writing that is not anywhere else in his work, even the degree in which he goes into hermaphroditic symbolism. Mm -hmm. And this is mm -hmm. like, so it's like, it's not like you on an off day. <laughs> <laughs> did, did he have those? I'm sure he, he have had a piece? Like, like everyone else. Uh, but it's, he's a, in the prime period of his studies of Christian symbolism and alchemy. Yeah, yeah. That, right. that is on a par with those works there. Wow. Coming back to sustaining, maintaining, and enriching the mission of the Philemon Foundation. To me, it seems, and I hope our listeners will become deeply empowered around this, there is a canon of Jung's work, which is a kind of secret treasure. And without the Philemon Foundation, these works may remain in obscurity that they will not be given the kind of rigorous treatment and respect and integrity that is required to bring them forward in a way that accurately reflects the work and respects the ground out of which it comes forward. And it would be a tremendous loss to all of us to miss this opportunity to bring these things forward. I think we have to sit with that yeah. really serious, serious repercussion if the collective cannot open its eyes and pockets and make sure that this important work stays forward. Yeah, that's well put in a way, as, it, as we were discussing earlier, that these works are not inert. Um, there's life in them. In that sense, I've been privileged to have read extensively in the, in the archives um, in Zurich and elsewhere in terms of, so I've been informed by what I've read in the published and unpublished canon. And it seems to me that that work deserves to be, um, to be made available to the general reading public. Not necessarily whether you agree or disagree with it. It's a sense, of, even if you are critical of Jung, you should base your criticisms on a complete corpus mm -hmm. and, and proper additions so it, in a way it's neutral is there any body of scholarship is only as good as its primary literature because mm -hmm. secondary literature is built up on that but you need proper foundations mm -hmm. and you can only have that with uh, as complete possible a canon edited um, to high standards and presented chronologically to take one point I mean that was Jung's own suggestion with the collected works is that it should, they should all have been presented in a chronological manner. Is Philemon kind of going through these uh, unpublished documents chronologically? I mean, I think published will be with proper chronology. So to take an example, if you have, in terms of Jung, um, you have essays like his 1917 book, Psychology of the Unconscious Processes, that itself was based on a revision of his essay from on New Parliaments and Psychology, it, it then goes through several revisions. In the collected works, they tend to just to publish the what they took to be the final version instead of presenting a, a variorum edition with all the changes. And in a way, ultimately, the collected works should be completely re-edited and 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 uh, retranslated, but um, at this point there seems little prospect of that. Just, I mean, this the expertise is there to do it, and the willingness just to do it, but the funds just aren't there. What would um, what do you imagine would ensue from a retranslation and republication of the collected works? Reading Jung, uh, I found I've had to do. A lot of work, for instance, when I was describing that one text, The Psychology of the Unconscious Processes, 
the most important version of that, which is this version of the book from 1917, isn't actually in the collected works, which is to underline the significance. What I had to do was like go and find all the versions and sit and do line by line comparisons oh to work out what was written when. So what has, to my mind, prevailed too much is what you could call the non-vintage reading of Jung, where you see people citing Jung and not saying when or what context did yeah, he say yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. So when you have a scholar that's working in productively for half a century, if you do that in a non-vintage way, you don't know if what was an early formulation or late formulation or something that he then later came to revise, it enables that chronology of as, as just a basic for understanding of what he said when and in what context. And that seems to me to be so important. In our training, we were responsible in our comprehensive exams for having a sense of the development of the ideas. When did he first use the term archetype? What was the context? How did his use of that term change? And boy, that was really hard to track down uh, for the, the major major concepts. And certainly, you know, I, I, th I think most of us are familiar with the, the different ways that he uses terms like individuation, for example, if you go through the collected works and you find all of his references to individuation, you know, he describes it slightly differently from one place to, to another, or, or the use of the term self. And um, having a, a sense of the historical progression of these concepts is so useful and I think particularly difficult, both because of how let's say, kind of recursive Jung was as a writer and a thinker, but also the way the collected works are published. It's very, very difficult to pull out that chronological string. So I, I really um, resonate with that. I'm also just noting that to me, and, and, and so new I'd be curious if you would agree with this, it seems that there's just such a perennial interest in Jung and that it kind of comes in waves, as it were. There was a kind of renaissance in, uh, um, in the popular culture in the 90s about Jung, and there were many kind of bestsellers, um, you know, Clarissa Pinkola Estes and James Hillman and uh, Thomas More's books. And, and it seems to me that we're, we're in another renaissance with uh, that maybe was inaugurated by the publication of the the red book but just so so many people find me and say i i i read i read this article about jung or i read this book by this jungian analyst and i i think i i think i want to do this it you know it, our podcast has just garnered so much uh really wonderful attention you know that honestly sort of surprised all three of us I think there's a lot of interest in this, and I'm I'm sure that the work of the Philemon Foundation has been important in generating that renewed interest. But also, uh, I hope that that can be bi-directional, and that the culture can support Philemon in continuing to bring this forward. Yes, I'm, we we certainly hope so. I mean, the foundation doesn't earn any royalties from the publication, so it's, it's solely dependent on um, its donors. Yeah, so just to lift that up and make sure that I understand it. So you're saying when the proceeds from the sales do not support the work of Philemon, is that correct? No, they don't. Okay. And Philemon is a 501c3 organization, so it is also tax deductible. That's right. Those of our yeah. listeners that have deep pockets, this is a worthy cause, just to be very direct about it. This is a turning point, and you can make a difference to the entire culture of Jungian literature, work, and studies. And we at This Jungian Life will be making a generous donation to the Philemon Foundation as well. I know I've, I've contributed several times myself personally, but we'll also contribute. That's much appreciated. And, and for people who may not know, uh, why is it called the Philemon Foundation? What's the, uh, we all know that as analysts, but I'm <laughs> teasing you forward to talk a little bit about Philemon. Uh, we needed a name, and my partner, Maggie, suggested it, and it struck me as immediately correct. 
and our listeners may n- not know, but Philemon was the name of one of the inner figures that Jung consulted with, for lack of a better word, had these extraordinary adventures with in this fantasy thinking, in this imaginal world. Jung attributed a tremendous amount of his insights and uh, seminal experiences to encounters with this inner figure who called himself Philemon. So it seems apt. You can go to the philemonfoundation.org slash donate. We'll have this um, as a link in the show notes. And I can't think of anything really more important in terms of a legacy that matters uh, to future generations and to all of us in terms of who we are, what our depths look like, what we can learn. So I hope everybody will be able to consider supporting additional contributions to uh, uh, the world library of the human soul. Mm, that's <laughs> a great term. And um, I'll just say also, um, and Sonu, maybe you can elaborate on this, but it, I'm at the Philemon website right now, and there there is a fundraising campaign, which we have just been referencing. And and of course, uh, you know, the web page makes it very clear that any donation is helpful. So if you can share 20 bucks, that's helpful too. There's also a crowdfunding appeal, uh, I guess, to publish the, the unpublished book on alchemy and individuation right. that we were just yeah. discussing. So that's a separate uh, fundraising appeal, Sonu? Yeah, that's a specific one. It's part of the general envelope. Wow. Okay. And it's it's just if you go to the website and you look under um, news and events, you'll you'll see the link for this. And it's just, there's this remarkable photograph of uh, the copy books there, which is really tantalizing. So lots of ways to get involved and, uh, and be supportive. And thank you, Sonu, not just for talking with us today, but for answering this call to be involved in Jung's work with such integrity and rigor. Um, It's always embarrassing, I'm sure, to be praised, but not everyone would have taken this on as a life work. And I'm sure it has been both a burden and has shaped you inexorably to take this on, to answer the call. So thank you. Thanks, that's appreciated. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.